So welcome everybody. Thank you for being here today with us for our third session of our Spring School Garden Leadership Training Series. And today we're gonna to be splashing into the topic of hydroponics as we learn about some simple systems that you can use in your classroom or your school garden setting. My name is Tiffany Torres and I am the State School Garden Specialist with Florida Agriculture in the Classroom and I'll be facilitating this workshop today. We have some amazing guest uh, teachers here with us today who have a wealth of knowledge and many years of experience teaching hydroponics in schools to students across Florida. So let's get started. And if you haven't already, Please go ahead and type your name, your organization, or your school, your county, and whether or not you've tried hydroponics into the chat box. Uh, one of our goals with this series is to increase networking across the state of Florida between educators and school garden leaders. So we want you to go ahead and use this time to connect with one another. And later in the webinar, we'll have a chance to share more of your story um, during our breakout room session. So that's exciting. And please note that you can also rename yourself um, in Zoom by clicking the three dots above your video. And please share your pronouns as right. So before we dive into content, I wanna take a moment to ground us in what this training series is all about and who the experts are in the room that are here to help you. So this webinar series is brought to you by Florida Agriculture in the Classroom and the University of Florida IFAS Extension Family Nutrition Program. And all webinars will be recorded for future viewing and CEUs are available upon request. And I also wanted to give you a reminder to mark your calendars and register for the rest of our upcoming sessions this spring if you haven't done so already. So today we'll be talking about uh, hydroponics and then next and two weeks from now we'll be talking about aquaponics uh, on March 30th. So you can register for all of our webinars at the Eventbrite, which is linked in the chat box here. And you can view any previous sessions on our YouTube channel as well. This webinar series is designed for Florida school garden leaders of really all levels to build gardening confidence, foster collaboration amongst leaders and strengthen garden programs for long-term success. And we do this with the goal of developing garden leaders and not just garden weeders. Um, our goal is to, at every session, include some element of gardening knowledge, curriculum connections, and community organizing strategies so that you can build a network as you grow. And a note on community, if you'd like to join our Facebook group, there's a School Garden Leadership Training Series Facebook group um, where you can chat and learn from people all across the state. And the link for that should be in the chat box as well. So both Florida Agriculture in the Classroom and the Family Nutrition Program are here to support you every step of the way in your gardening journey. So please reach out to us directly if you'd like additional consultation services beyond this webinar. And a little bit more about Florida Agriculture in the Classroom. We are a statewide nonprofit that is funded through the specialty license plate ag tag that you see here on the left. We offer free educational resources on our website, such as school garden curriculum, activity newspapers, and agriculture agricultural themed lessons. We also offer a variety of farm to school programming, such as our Agricultural Literacy Day event, virtual farm field trips, which are coming soon uh, this, this spring and next fall, workshops and trainings, both remote and in person, and school garden consultation services as needed. We also, also offer a host of grants and awards, such as teacher grants, school garden grants, volunteer grants, and our Excellence in Teaching Ag Award, which just so happens that we have one of our speakers who won that award here with us today, uh, that's Deb Walker. And so you can see all of our contact there, information there on the right. So please contact us anytime for additional support. And our second partner in the series is the University of Florida IFAS Extension Family Nutrition Program, also known as FNP. FMP provides SNAP education in Florida across 40 different counties and has been doing so since 1996. FMP helps limited resource families in Florida access more nutritious food choices on a budget and adopt healthier eating and physical activity habits to reduce the risk of obesity and chronic disease. And I wanna take a moment to introduce our speakers before we dive into our content. We have with us today, Jeremy Roden, who is the Horticulture and Program Specialist with Curriculum and Instruction at Marion County Public Schools. And we also have Deb Walker, who is an agri-science educator at Sarasota Military Academy. Thank you to you both for being here. 
And Becky Swanholtz and I will also be facilitating and managing the uh, Q&A session at the end. So just a quick overview of what we're gonna cover today. First, we'll dive into a presentation by Jeremy about teaching hydroponics, which includes an overview of all the hydroponic systems, some STEM connections. We'll go over the Aero Garden system specifically and the Vertigo Tower Garden. And then we'll watch a video that was made specially for this webinar by Deb Walker, in which she teaches us how to create your own deep water culture system out of a Rubbermaid container, and also how to grow your own seedlings on a budget for hydroponic systems. Then we'll flow into our breakout rooms and have a chance to get to know one another and learn from each other. And we'll close with our Q&A session. And a note on Q&A, feel free to put any questions into the chat box as we go along. We will not stop for questions during the presentation, but we'll try to answer as many questions from the chat box as possible at the end. And like I said, we'll be here for 30 minutes afterwards to go over any questions. So before I hand it over to Jeremy, I wanted to take a moment to share this slide with you, which is titled Recipe for Success. Uh, there are many types of hydro hydroponic systems and ways to do hydroponics. Uh, my professional opinion is to always follow best practices, read instructions, and stick to the science. A colleague of mine shared this metaphor or analogy with me recently, and it really helped me think through the difference between growing food in soil in traditional ways versus growing food without soil and hydroponics. And what he said is that gardening is like cooking and you can add some spices, a little more of this, take away some of that and you'll still end up with an edible product. But hydroponics is much more like baking. It requires you to follow a recipe and a set of instructions in order to achieve successful results. Um, I don't know about you, but I have tried to bake a cake many times. I'm not a baker, much more of a cooker. And sometimes I don't follow the recipe and I think it'll turn out fine and it doesn't. <laughs> but this is just a testament to um, what is possible really with hydroponics if you do follow those best practices and guidelines. So I have some pictures here that I find kind of inspiring from the Epcot uh, behind, behind the seeds tour. And you can see a variety of different um, hydroponics, aquaponics, and other types of systems that they have set up here. Um, this is actually a nine pound lemon that was grown in a sand system um, that Jeremy will share with us later. And we have some Brussels sprouts hanging here uh, with an aeroponic system, some tower units. I think there's some fish back here. And then this really giant uh, zucchinis <laughs> that they grew, grew using hydroponics techniques. So. It really is a cool way to grow food. Um, and I'd encourage you to check out the Google Drive folder for additional recipes, like how to create a simple floating bucket garden. Um, we are gonna go over only three types of systems in detail today, and that will be the aeroponics, um, vertigo tower systems, and deep water culture. So with that, I will hand it over to Jeremy and he's gonna tell us more about how to teach with hydroponics. All right, good afternoon. Um, as Tiffany said, I'm Jeremy Roden with Marion County Public Schools and I am the horticulture program specialist um, there. And I have been there for, I taught there, or I've taught as an ag teacher for about seven years with a specialty in horticultural sciences. And then um, I recently moved into this position about two years ago, uh, almost two years ago, so. All right, so um, first off, what are hydroponics? So one of the biggest misconceptions with hydroponics is that uh, it's only growing plants submersed in a liquid media or liquid substrate um, when actually it's growing plants in any type of soilless media. So that can be coconut fiber, perlite, all sorts of different things. And we'll kind of talk about those in just a second. But just make sure you understand that it is not only growing simply in a liquid solution. That is hydroponics, but there's all sorts of different types of hydroponics and we'll get into those. All right, so a quick history of hydroponics. So many civilizations have used hydroponic techniques throughout history. Um, and you hear about this, you see this, you can see a lot of it just looking in the Aztec uh, and what they've done in Mexico and, and other places around the world. And you can see kind of some of the things they have here in the bottom left-hand picture, you can see a, a very common practice that is still used today in many Asian cultures where they have floating raft systems where they're growing uh, different types of crops in those floating rafts. And that's kind of what you see in the um, bottom left-hand picture, top right corner. 
And so that is a common practice at scene. It's, it's a type of deep water culture, and that's something we'll be talking about a little later today, but it is still actively used as a type of hydroponic growing. All right, so uh, with hydroponics today, obviously they're a lot more advanced. Uh, in this picture here, we have a vertigo tower on the left-hand side, which is kind of more of a drip system. And on the right side, we have a special grow tower that actually works as an aeroponic system. We'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, but there's a variety of systems with hydroponics, aquaponics, uh, and then aeroponics. Uh, over time, these systems have become more advanced and more sufficient as far as water uh, use and nutrient use. And because of that, we're able to grow higher yield. So to kind of give you an example, if you look at this one um, tower on the left-hand side, the vertigo tower, uh, you can grow, if you're growing lettuce in that tower, you could grow about 25 times the amount of lettuce that you can grow in the space in the soil that it takes to grow one head of lettuce. And you would do so almost twice to three times as fast because the nutrients are supplied 24 hours a day as they're getting their drip. Uh, and they're not having to search the soil for nutrients, which is what most plant roots have to do. And so that's why it typically takes longer to grow in the soil than it does with hydroponics. All right, so with hydroponics, there are a variety of media that you can use. And when we say media, that is a term that we use for the substrate that it's growing in. Many different types of hydroponic media have absolutely no nutrient value at all. It literally is just a completely uh, bare material that is used to prop up the plant or hold up the plant or provide its roots with a, a, a successful media, if you will. Um, so we have coconut fiber, which is basically the husk of a coconut. It's really good because it holds the water moisture really well and it comes compacted. Uh, and it's, it's a byproduct that is very useful in hydroponics. It's also fairly cheap compared to many other different type of hydroponics. There's perlite, which is a volcanic rock. This again is a very good media. It is a little more advanced. Uh, I try to keep away from it with schools as much as possible. The dust from it is considered a carcinogen. It's actually, it sounds a lot more dangerous than it is. As long as it's wet down, the dust has settled. It's very safe to use. You don't need a mask or any type of goggles at all, but we still have a lot of teachers that get very nervous around it. So we tend to stay away from it as best we can. And you can use rice holes in place of that, which is listed here. We also have expanded clay pebbles, which are very costly and expensive. Uh, rock wool, another very costly, expensive one, kind of like a fiberglass material. Um, and then sand, which is a soil particle, but it also can be used hydroponically because it has very, very low nutrient value uh, and straight up pl uh, plain clay sand uh, is very good for that. And then vermiculite is another type of media we use that helps hold water and it's a really good uh, media. And then as I mentioned before, rice holes. All right, so um, today we're gonna be talking about two main types of hydroponic systems and that's gonna be drip system and water culture systems. But as you can see in this little diagram here, there are multiple different types of hydroponic systems that you can use. And this is, these are listed here are the main types, but there's actually a variety of, of different types um, that aren't listed here. All right, so this is an example of one that we did at one of our schools. Uh, we call it a sand bed system. It is literally a, it's a 12 foot long by 12 inch high um, raised bed, if you will. It's only one foot wide and we lined it with a type of liner like ground cloth and then we fit, filled it completely with clay sand. And then uh, what we do is we lay two rows of drip tape on there and that drip tape connects to a trash can we have on the outside that we use as our nutrient reservoir. And we mix our nutrients into that reservoir as solution. And, and then basically every day we have that set on a timer that you can buy at Lowe's or Home Depot and it comes on few times a day and it waters that system. And so it's a simple, quick hydroponic system you can do and it's great for growing root type vegetables such as carrots, beets, um, onions do really well on it. So it's a, a pretty easy, fun, affordable, quick thing that you can do. The next one is a trench system. This system we've also kind of used at some of our schools. It can be a little uh, more tricky to do or to deal with. It's very similar to the uh, sandbox, but instead what you do is you dig a trench in the ground about, about 14 to 16 inches deep and probably about the same width. And then you fill that in with a hydroponic media. In this case, because of cost, we actually use fine um, chopped up 
pine uh, and this we like the pine bark so we use fine chopped up pine composted pine bark and we fill these trenches with it it has absolutely no uh, nutrient uh, nutrients in it so what we have to do is we put those lines in it those uh, drip hoses and then those also just like in a carrot bed are connected to a tank um, right on the outside of it in a timer that has a, a nutrient mixture in there and so every time the water comes on it comes out of that tank and it fills nutrients to the system this is a nice system because it does insulate your roots underground and it keeps them nice and warm but you can grow all sorts of things in here and it is a phenomenal system um, once you have it up and going all right, and then I'm not gonna talk too much about this because I know we're going to uh, discuss it more shortly, but this is kind of water culture. This is a floating bed system. We have several of these at a variety of our schools. It's a very simple, low maintenance system. You don't need electric necessarily. You, you fill it with water and your nutrients. And then from there, you just let mother nature do, do its course. And it's a very simple, easy system. You can make it as big or as, as small as you would like. We also have uh, Dutch beto bucket systems, which are primarily used for growing larger crops, uh, especially vine type plants. So in this case, we have a lot of tomatoes, cucumbers. Uh, we've grown a lot of bell peppers this way. It's a really unique plant. This is our, our unique system. This is more of a uh, wicking system. And so uh, it's a lot trickier in my opinion. It's one of the complex hydroponic systems you use, but it is a really neat one that you see a lot in industry. So I did wanna share about that. All right, and this is, in my opinion, perhaps one of the most um, extensive hydroponic systems to use. It is a very, very unique system. I think when most people think of hydroponics, this is one that they typically, their mind shifts to, or a lot of people want to start with this. In fact, it was my mistake. My very first year getting hydroponic systems, my first grant I got was getting one of these systems. And I learned very quickly after doing multiple trainings with UF and and all sorts of other uh, institutes that this is actually one of the most complex types of systems you can start with. And the reason for that is there's a very minimal room for failure. So it's an NFT system, um, nutrient film technique. And this is more like that traditional idea of hydroponics where the roots are submerged in a liquid at all times. Um, and the liquid runs down those channels. And the unfortunate part about this system is the moment you lose power and that pump goes off and the liquid uh, solution is no longer moving through those roots, you have about an hour to save your plants before you lose your entire crop. Uh, whereas in most other systems, because they're submerged in a media that holds moisture, typically you can go a couple days before losing your crops. This, you only have about an hour. And so it is a very advanced system. You need a lot to it. We had to, for some of our schools that grow with this, we had to put in big generators at their school greenhouses in order for them to work effectively over weekends and holiday breaks. All right, so I'm going to talk uh, more in depth of vertigo tower system. So this is primarily what we grow in Marion County. We, we have probably at least 15, 15 to 17 different types of hydroponic systems we use across the county, but this is our most popular one that almost all of our uh, schools that have horticulture programs use. Um, we grow a variety of things from herbs to lettuce to peppers. Um, all sorts of things in this type of system. And, and the, the teachers absolutely love it. It's very versatile, it's very simple. UF actually recommends uh, that this, this system for beginners just because of how simple and easy it is to use. And you can get it in all shapes and sizes as we'll talk about in the next slide. So um, here you see a few different options. So there is a VG1 tower, which has a reservoir built into the bottom. That's the one on the far left. Uh, the cost for that is about $260, but you can grow equivalent in that one tower what you can grow in a four by eight foot raised bed. Uh, and it's, it grows much faster. You can grow many other uh, crops in it. It's, it's pretty unique in itself. The reservoir is at the bottom. So you mix your nutrients and you fill that reservoir. And then when you plug in your uh, pump, which has a timer equipped with it, uh, it comes on when it's supposed to and it does everything in itself. So literally all you do is you plant your seedling in the corner of each one of those boxes. And then you plug it in and as long as you set your timer to um, the amount it needs, which is pretty consistent from beginning to end, about three minutes, three times a day, then you're pretty good to go. Uh, the only thing about this particular one, because the reservoir is built into the bottom, you have to have some type of covering on it. So if you were to have this set up outside and it rained, the rainwater would seep through those pots, which each of those white pots have holes on it, which is how um, the liquid solution moves down the tower and it would seep through into the reservoir. 
Uh, so it has to be covered. And if it's covered indoors, well, then you're having to add a lighting component, which excuse me, makes it a lot uh, more expensive. And the second picture you see here, this is a two tower system. He literally, the company um, Vertigo, it's based in Marion County actually. And um, they use these systems all over the world. In fact, the owner of it was one of the designers who designed the Epcot greenhouse for those who have been to Epcot. And if you go to Epcot, you'll see these Vertigo towers are still standing there all over the place throughout the greenhouses on that ride um, because they're, they're a phenomenal product. But in this case, this is an example of a tower that is not necessarily connected to a reservoir on the bottom. And so this is no longer considered a circulating system like the VG1 system. So in this case, you can have this standing outside in the open. This is a two tower system for about $300. You can have this standing outside in the open. You don't need a covering on it. It doesn't have to be in a greenhouse. It's pretty simple. Um, your reservoir, you probably would fill every, every two weeks or so. And he would you know, provide you with a nutrient solution for that. Um, as far as the lighting needs for the Vertigro indoors, it would be, someone asked that question. Um, it would really be dependent on what you're growing. Um, for the most part, the lights that you would need, they say in general when you're growing indoors with plants that the lights always need to be about three to four inches from the plant. So as the plants grow, they have to be able to be expanded out. And there's all sorts of different light options out there that you can buy, but trying to do something with a tower like this and having lights all around it for all of your plants is pretty complex. I do know the Vertigo company is trying to work on something that you can buy as an additional part to attach to that VG1 unit. Uh, it's just uh, very difficult to do. Uh, and it is also gonna be very costly, I'm sure, because lighting for indoor growing is very expensive, typically. Um, but what, with the uh, second system that you see there in the middle, you can get as many towers as you want. We have a 100 tower system at one school. We have a 30 tower, a 20 tower. So, but it essentially works the same way with your reservoir. And I'll kind of go more into that in the second or in the next slide. And then finally, the last picture on this is the tabletop garden. This is also a Vertigo system um, that essentially works similarly to the VG1. It does circulate into that reservoir at the, um, at the end there with the gray tank but each one of those black pots have an emitter on top of it and it feeds the solution from the top. And then at the bottom of those black pots, it drains into a PVC pipe that drains right back into that reservoir. So it's a circulating system. This one's really nice because it's handicap accessible. So a lot of our programs, uh, we have several ESC programs that have a high population of handicapped students. And so this is one that they really like to have because the wheelchairs can get around it pretty easily, which for the most part you can do with, with all of these, but it's a very popular one for that reason. Um, as far as, sorry, I'm looking at the uh, questions here. So as far as the plants, typically when we plant the towers, we keep it pretty consistent with what we're growing. Uh, we rarely mix um, in the towers. Like if we're doing like different plants, we rarely do different plants at a time just because we are typically grow in such large quantities and we do so for our school cafeterias and our farm to school program. Um, but what I have been told by some of the researchers with UF hydroponics is you typically uh, put your plants that require more nutrients and more water. And of course that would take some research, uh, but you normally put that towards the bottom part of your plants. So that way you're making sure that they're getting enough and you always aim for a 10% uh, leachate. And you do that by calculating how much liquid solution is moving out through the bottom pot. There's kind of a little, if you're familiar with it, that's kind of how you would figure that out. But then you also can adjust the type of media you use and how much water holding capacity they have um, for, for that uh, to make sure that they're getting enough nutrients. So to kind of look at just a quick overview of how these um, towers work, basically you have a reservoir at one end which has your nutrient solution uh, in it. And then you have a pump in there and that pump comes on on a timer. You have it hooked to a timer. And then typically like our towers are watered three times a day and each time they're watered for three minutes. And then at the top of the hose above the towers, there are little emitters as you see in that little circle at the top. And when that water comes on, it basically feeds from the top and that drains all the way down through every pot. And then at the very bottom of the pot, you want to see that drain for 10 seconds. So typically the way we set up our timer is we'll turn the water on and we'll keep that water running and still until we start seeing water dripping out of the bottom pot. 
and then we'll add 10 seconds to that time. And that's how we aim for a 10% leachate to make sure that we have enough water going through all of those pots. So 10% leachate actually is collected in the little black pot at the bottom, uh, and we, which you see in the right hand side picture. And we put media in that pot as well with plants that need very little nutrients. So they're getting basically the excess leachate and things like herbs or chives, those things grow really well on that. So that's pretty much the gist of how these systems work. It is not a circulating system unless you have that VG1, which has the reservoir on the bottom, and then that one circulates. Everything else is, it's non-circulating. Um, so here's some pictures of our lettuce that we grow. We grow a ton of lettuce, a uh, lot of bell peppers, which is are pictured on the left, um, right as they're about to start blooming and producing more peppers. All right, so incorporating STEM with hydroponics, obviously there's a lot of things that you can do to incorporate STEMs, everything from kindergarten to college. And um, I mean, this includes in the picture on the right, this is a picture I took at UF uh, Research Hydroponic Facility, which is up in Live Oak. So if you're near there, they have a phenomenal program up there. But in this case, they're using these little uh, float buckets, which are actually just feed pans uh, for livestock. And they're using them as floating water culture systems. And each one of those buckets have a, a nutrient that's missing from it. So it kind of allows students to see what type of deficiencies plants have. And so I really enjoy this one. I've actually replicated this with my students at the high school level when I was teaching there. And it's, it's a pretty uh, fun one to do with the kids. And then there's all sorts of things you can do if you want to get advanced as far as like media and checking uh, their nutrient levels using different types of meters and things like that. But um, as far as elementary and middle school goes, there's, there's all sorts of things that tie back to standards. You can discuss photosynthesis, uh, respiratory, or excuse me, respiration, transpiration. There's a lot that goes into it um, that can be incorporated through STEM. And then of course, the whole technology side of it. There's a lot there as well. And thinking about hydroponics, period, I mean, this is kind of the way of the future. So I always tell the students, you know, uh, researchers say that we need to provide, provide 10,000 times the amount of food that we've grown in the past um, 200 years in the next 50 years to supply enough food for all of our, for all of our population. And so how are we doing that with less resources? We have less land, less clean water. So when you really think about it, hydroponics are really going to be the way of the future. They're, they're, that's essentially what they are becoming now. So. so with basic science, again, you can cover plant processes like photosynthesis um, and the others. Um, you can experiment with pH and nutrients, light color and spectrum effects, light meters. You can get really expensive ones or you can get fairly cheap ones and those are really fun to do. Water holding capacity of different types of media that you use. Uh, looking at environmental conditions, plant parts and germination. And there's just so many other things that you can really tie in with science. Science is one of the easy ones to find how you can tie hydroponics in. Um, again, with advanced science, you can include pH adjusting, changing out your nutrients, as I showed in the picture earlier, calculating parts per million of nutrients in your water, fertilizer and pesticide. I mean, the list goes on and on. There's quite a bit that you can do when it comes to science and hydroponics. With math and business, there's so much calculating when it comes to parts per million and plant nutrients. Now I can tell you that's a very, that's if you want to get advanced. So um, don't think that because hydroponics offer these as lessons in the classroom, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're actually that difficult. So I know when I first started getting uh, into hydroponics, it, I was told by many professionals, oh, you need to be checking the pH every day. You need to be checking the electric conductivity. You need to be checking all these different things. And it almost overwhelmed me quite a bit because I didn't have time to do all of that first off as a teacher, but then also it just, it, it was pretty advanced because I didn't want my students handling a $400 test meter. Um, you know, so it's, it's one of those things that you don't have to worry about necessarily. But if you're looking for ways to tie in math and business, this is a great way of doing it, especially if you're growing for things like in our case, we're growing for our farm to school programs. And so we need to know how many heads of lettuce we're growing, you know, um, how much the weight is, how much are we procuring each week, total produce. So there's a lot of math that can be incorporated into all of that. Record keeping is a big one when it comes to all of this. So um, geography and history, of course, we can talk about plants and, and the history of hydroponics. 
uh, understanding what plants can grow in different climates and regions around the world, and then what types of plants grow where and best. Obviously with engineering, there's quite a bit you can do here. I've had students actually try to invent their own types of hydroponic systems and see what they can do there. And that's been pretty fun. Um, students have come up with all sorts of different things and then they've learned to tweak them in different ways. And some of which, you know, hopefully one day we'll see on the market because I've seen some pretty phenomenal hydroponic systems, but, um, but yes, engineering and physics can definitely easily be tied in. All right, so I know we're uh, getting short on time. So with farm to school, um, farm to school is, is a huge part of our county where we're at. And this includes nutrition education, local procurement and school gardens. It's kind of like that three circle model that was originally discussed in the beginning. Um, so <clears throat> there is a new certification program out there that uh, farm to school is wanting schools get involved with. And that if you get that certification, it really helps you to be able to get your school produce into school cafeterias and be used for those things. So I encourage you guys to look into that and Tiffany can give you more information on that. You know, the great thing about farm to school is students gain the firsthand experience in doing all of this. And then on top of that, students were finding that grow their own produce are more likely to, to try their own produce and more likely to try to eat it. So there's a lot of benefits there. So you have fresh produce going directly into the cafeteria. Students take ownership of it because they are growing it and they have fun with it. And then they're also more likely to try it. Um, work, we work a lot with local farmers, getting their produce brought into our schools, which helps the local economy. And then there's many grants available for farm to school, all, all sorts of grants. And so I really encourage you to look into farm to school. I know a lot of you are just getting started, but it's a, it's a great thing to be involved with, especially for schools. To kind of give you a little bit about what we do in Marion County. So we have a program and a partnership with the Marion County Hospital District, and we created a program called Fitness and Nutrition in Schools, or FANS. It is grades K through 12 in Marion County, and we do this, and we have this big initiative to kind of help change a chronic disease state and obesity rate in Marion County. Um, and we do this by focusing on future generations. So with our partnership with the hospital district, they are the company who leases out uh, the Marion County Hospital, which is owned by the county. And so with the money that they use to lease, it continuously grows every year into this. It's in a big corpus and it grows a lot of um, interest on it every year. So there's tons of money there. And so what they've done was they decided to try to change those statistics of Marion County. They're going to add all these garden programs at all 52 schools and start teaching kids where their food comes from uh, and how it's good for them and what type of nutri nutrition comes from it. So what we've done is in our elementary school, we incorporate raised beds where we teach students where their food comes from and let them grow foods and try them in their classroom doing taste tests. In the middle school level, we create what's called horticulture parks where we provide them with a variety of growing systems, everything from hydroponics to in-ground gardening, raised beds, all sorts of things that kind of bridge them into our high school programs, which is where we offer them state-of-the-art uh, hydroponic greenhouses, kind of like the one you see in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, and, it and we grow food for the school's cafeteria essentially. So uh, the greenhouse you see in the bottom right hand corner is actually the largest greenhouse in our county. It's about uh, about 6,200 square feet. It's actually the largest school greenhouse in the state of Florida. Uh, and it's really unique because of it being only hydroponic based. And in that one greenhouse, there are six different hydroponic systems in there that grow school cafeteria, um, including microgreens as well. So it's a very unique setup. Um, it's We really take pride in it. It's something that we really love. and you know, we're very fortunate because we have a great partnership with someone where money is not necessarily a factor. That is normally not the case <laughs> with many people. And, and we completely understand that. In fact, when we first started um, our farm to school program, that was not the case. We just later um, had this uh, partnership come up and, and I can't express enough how important it is to have community partnerships. And this is kind of what led to us when we started doing our farm to school program. So I encourage that. So uh, one of the things that we are moving into is we are actually in our elementary schools, we've been doing the raised beds now for about four years. And we have found that there's about 25% buy-in from the school. So only about a quarter buy-in from the teachers and the students, but we really want more teachers and students to buy into this. So what we're doing is we are piloting a new program this coming fall where we are choosing three elementary schools and we are providing each grade level with a small unit called an arrow garden. Um, a lot of people hear the word arrow garden and see the name and they immediately think aeroponic, but it actually is kind of a deep water culture system. 
And so um, it's a very unique system, but um, it's gonna be offered kindergarten through fifth grade, one per grade level. Um, and we're also gonna provide a six week workbook that includes STEAM and nutrition. So this is a way that the teachers can incorporate it into their classroom. It covers all of the standards that are in their curriculum maps during that time. And so this allows each class to be able to take ownership in their own garden and grow their own garden in the classroom. You can buy these units for about $100. Um, and I can tell you, I have grown several different crops in them already. And when I say super easy, like I am buying one of these for my countertop at home. Like you add water to it every two weeks and a cap full of nutrients. And that is all you do. And then you harvest as much as you want and it continues to grow. And it is an absolutely phenomenal system. Super, super easy. Especially if you don't have a green thumb, this is the system for you. It is absolutely amazing. It's compact, fits great into a classroom. It's amazing, it has a built-in light into it. I can't, I can't advertise for this, this system enough. I mean, it is, it is phenomenal. So if you're interested in it, I definitely encourage you, especially if you're trying to get started somewhere, this is a really unique system to get started with to try to gain that green thumb and then advancing onto a, a more complex hydroponic system down the road might be something worth looking into. But this is kind of the way that we're looking at changing all of our elementary programs at this point to kind of get more teacher and student buy-in to learn about nutrition and hydroponics. So some of our partnerships, we partner with our ESC program, obviously our CTE, which is our career and technical education department. Uh, food and nutrition department is a really big one. If your food and nutrition department is not on board for farm to school, then unfortunately there's really nothing you can do. Um, farm to school goes through food and nutrition. Uh, your food and nutrition director oversees that entire piece of that. So um, it's very important that food and nutrition is on board. Local businesses, we actually, one way we just started sustaining our programs, we are selling some fresh herbs to some of our local restaurants. Uh, that's kind of fairly new for us, so we're just getting into that, but that is something that you can do. One Vertigro hydroponic tower grows enough basil for a restaurant for about a week. So, um, and, and you know, you don't harvest all of it at one time, you take cuttings from it, and that basil continues to grow week after week after week, so you're not having to replant a new tower every week. So there's a lot of great things you can do. Obviously, IFAS extension has been absolutely tremendous for us. And then, of course, Florida Farm to School. All right, I know we're short on time. Um, any questions? Thanks, Jeremy. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think we'll save, since we're running a little far on time, we'll save any questions that you didn't already get to, to the end. Um, okay. And so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and play our video that we have set up. Um, this is a video made by Deb Walker showcasing the deep water culture systems that she uses in Sarasota um, at Sarasota Military Academy. So this is about a nine minute video and then we'll go through a brief presentation and she can answer questions about how to set this up. So give me just a second to transition that. My name is Deb Walker and I'm an agri-science teacher at Sarasota Military Academy Prep here in Sarasota and here in our garden we have traditional raised beds gardens but we also have a large hydroponic garden. So there are some systems I would just like to show you quickly on the slide. I think it should be up nutrient film technique and drip system. These are more advanced systems that you might see on YouTube and people might want you to start with. I would not. We're going to start with deep water culture. Um, that's what I'm standing in front of. And uh, the reason I like this is that it's simple. It's inexpensive to set up. You can basically walk away from it. You put in your seedlings and then you walk away for four weeks and then they have our adult plants. You don't have to worry about power outages and you don't have to come up here on weekends and check on them. So in this system, you have roots that are dangling in nutrient solution. So the roots are hanging down and they're oxygenated by bubbles down below from an air stone. And super fast from seedling to adult is probably six weeks total from beginning to end. So I'd like to show you this one uh, first because this is, if anybody's gonna start hydroponics, this is the place to start, I think. So let's go with materials. What I use right here, I get this 10 gallon, I use roughneck totes and I get them at either Home Depot or uh, Ace Hardware. I've not seen them on Amazon. I like them because they're soft and their lids are really easy to drill into because you want to go, you're going to drill holes for the three inch net pots. I have all the materials at the end, by the way. So you could either have a nice hole saw 
drill those holes on the top. Or you can use a case cutter and it's not so pretty, but it still works. So you have the reservoir, you have your lid with holes cut in it. Then we need to get a pump, cheap pump on Amazon or Walmart, just a $10 pump. Uh, aquarium tubing, you'll see on a lot of um, uh, shows that they say that has to be opaque. You're just pumping air, you're not pumping nutrient solution, it doesn't have to be opaque. And then just a small air stone, even the smaller ones can be fine. So you're going to place this in the reservoir, hook it up to your pump, and then you're going to add nutrient solution. When you plug in your pump, it's going to add oxygen bubbles to the roots. So the nutrient solution, that's a whole another story. I buy mine at Big Earth. It's a, a huge bag. Uh, it's 815 36 NBK. Now, if you have the funds, it's special order there, and, and it's the best to use. But you can also get smaller versions of it on Amazon or Greenway, as long as you get 815 36 and it's granular. And if you mix that properly per gallon, whatever it's, it's going to take to fill up your nutrient solution, your pH, everything should be good. And you're going to fill it up to within an inch of the top. So you have your turn on your pump, you have your pump adding oxygen, you have the lid on top of a reservoir that contains your 81536. We're bringing you indoors now to show you how exactly how we start our seeds. Um, Amazon has seeds, very inexpensive lettuce seeds. This is Butter Crunch, my favorite, and you'll find out it's going to be the best one for you too as far as your first system. So what we have the kids do is we pour out our seeds in little cups we have them carefully sprinkle them in dirt then this is just a rotisserie chicken base no budget so we just have some regular potting soil we just have the kids sprinkle some seeds try to make a carpet of the whole thing because when we use more than just deep water culture I'm gonna need probably a hundred seedlings in, in one day planting so then we're going to cover that with a quarter inch of soil and let and put them under the LED lights which are to my right here. So this is where we have all of our seedlings starting. In about five to six days, you get start of lots of little lettuce. This is a type of arugula. And it's easy because it's just done in soil. If you would like to spend the money and do rock wool, you could do rock wool. It'd be a lot easier, but it's also a lot more expensive. So I shy away from this and keep that for my other systems. This is certainly the easy way to go. These lettuces then can be divided up, and it's amazing how rough you can be with them. You can divide these little guys up and separate them and then make a whole nother tray until they're ready to go, which would be probably an inch and a half tall. And then you're ready to take them outside to the deep water culture outside. Six. So now it's time for the seedlings. That's the hard part. Where do you get the seedlings? Because you have to think three weeks ahead of time to plant them in soil before you're ready to actually start your system. You can buy them at Home Depot, but usually they're a little old. I like planting them myself or having the kids plant them. So there's a slide of this. This is butter crunch lettuce that the kids planted. It's a little close, but that's okay. We can pull them out as they get bigger and spread them out in other soil. And when they get large enough, in this case, this is, this is kale, I believe. We can just pull it out of the soil. I just shake it off in the dirt lightly, put it in a net pot, make sure it's standing up, and then you can place it right in the deep water culture. Now you wanna make sure that the level of the water is about halfway up, halfway up the net pots. Now when you first put them in, they're gonna get sunburned. So I just take pots and give them a little sunshade like that for the first day or so, and then they should be good to go. So as you can see here, we have, this is bok choy I'm experimenting with. I'm not sure that's gonna work. We have butter crunch lettuce. That is the best to, to, to use, the best. We have basil, kale, that's another experiment. This is mint. Different kinds of lettuces are always fun. Swiss chard we're trying. So it's even fun to get a lettuce mix so that when you plant these, you have all different colors um, on your deep water culture. I think one of my pictures showed that. So that makes it a lot more fun. So in about four weeks after you put the seedlings in, you should be good to go. If your power goes off, so they don't have bubbles for the weekend, it's not gonna matter at all. 
Now, if you have the money, um, I would really recommend getting the pH and a TDS meter because you do want to monitor this if you have large rains or maybe your plants are getting burned on the edges. You would like to know the TDS, which is the total dissolved solids, and the pH. Lettuce is pretty hardy, but if you get outside of that hardy zone, it's not going to grow or it's going to turn brown. So this is on Amazon. I have a slide. It's $34 and has three modes, temperature, pH, and TDS. So on TDS, I like it to be between 650 and about 800, 850 for lettuces and herbs. And when you set it up, it stays there. Uh, the pH has a tendency to creep up to about 6.5. You want it under 6, 5.5 five to 6. So even though you could probably get by without this, it, it's nice when you have problems to have this and be able to document uh, what you did right, what you did wrong, how you fixed it, because you will always need to go back to that. Always document everything when you have these systems. Um, when I talk about nutrient solution, I don't use the liquid solution at all. I don't know if some people maybe have luck with them. I just find this works for me because I went to our local hydroponic farm. If you're gonna learn how to do something, you should really go to the people who make who do it for a living. And uh, they showed me how to use the 81536 in this type of situation. So I've never really gotten into the liquid that much. And the other thing is after the TDS, if you test it and you have a 6.6, at pH, what are you going to do? Well, on Amazon, you can buy pH down. It's a bottle for about $15, and you really only need about four or five drops sometimes to get your pH down, so the bottle is going to last forever. So that would probably be the last thing I would suggest buying. Now, if you don't want to set up a big tub, um, I have six glasses, so I usually have six tubs here, big ones. You can get by with little ones. These little three gallons work. Same thing, tuck me and they have lids and you can get, I can get four heads of lettuce in here. These I usually put five or six, but these are, these work. And if you can see on the slides that you can move these indoors too. They do not have to be outdoors. So these grow very well under uh, LED lights, but that's another expense. But if you just want to go the simple way, this is the way to do it. And hydro season is from about October to April. That's it. Once it starts to get warm, we can't do this. And that's when I move it indoors. Okay, you can grow this in the middle of summer inside in air conditioning. But for schools, it works out well to be uh, from like October to, to March, April. Okay? So at the end of my presentation, I put my web page, and on there are a lot of suggestions, and also my email. If anybody would like a copy of this presentation, I'd be glad to send it to them. Or if you want to send me any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Okay? Thank you. Well, I don't know about you all, but I definitely have goosebumps after learning about uh, the Marion County Public Schools and Sarasota's innovative approach. So I'm going to flip back over to our PowerPoint, PowerPoint now, and then Deb can teach us a little bit more about how she implements this program. Okay, well, I will tell you after following Jeremy, this is a tough act to follow, um, but I tried to present a very simple system that all you can follow. So um, this is our school and our hydroponic system. That's NFT on the far right and the other are raised bed pictures. Um, okay, next slide. Uh, these are the system, just like Jeremy said, I don't start with these. They are definitely more complex. Uh, nutrient film technique and the drip system are both, both used uh, commercially by farmers, and they are a lot of fun, but uh, don't start with them. Uh, here um, on uh, the right, we have Brussels sprouts and broccoli growing. So in, in that system, you can get past lettuces and herbs because you're adding the micronutrients, um, calcium nitrate and magnesium sulfate as well. So that's a whole nother ball game. Stay away from it uh, when you're beginning. Okay, next slide. So as you can see, we're low budget at SMA Prep. Um, all of our little uh, you know, tubs lined up with all the different aerators. It's super, super easy. It was very easy to divide by classrooms. Okay, next slide. I'm going quickly because I know we're short time. Okay, so it's super easy to set up. As you can see, it's inexpensive, little maintenance. And as Jeremy said, a power failure is not a disaster. I lost an entire crop NFT with an NFT 
power failure, but this is great. And you do not have to visit on weekends for this one. So that's a plus for me. Okay, next slide. And that's just day one after the seedlings. And those are rather, rather large seedlings. I usually don't get them that big uh, to day 23. So this is not a system that the commercial farmers use, but it's a big wow factor for kids. Okay, next slide. And yes, look at the roots. Um, that's what I mean. The kids absolutely adore this system because when they pull out their lettuce, they just can't believe the size of it. Um, I like the romaine type lettuce rather than the head type. The head type is pretty. You get a lot more yield with this type, especially if you do cut and come again, which as Jeremy alluded to, where you can just cut off like the outside leaves and let the inside grow. Uh, hydroponic lettuce in this system will grow two to three times faster than in raised beds. But if you add cut and come again, you can get three to four times the yield. Okay, next slide. Oh, in there, that um, this, the boy on the left is the one holding the lettuce mix. So if you do a lettuce mix, it's kind of fun with all the, the pretty colors. And again, the roots, the, the kids like. By the way, the kid on the left is the one who made the video for me. So God bless him. I thought he did an excellent job as a seventh grader. Okay, next slide. Uh, and again, this is kind of redundant. The roots are suspended in nutrients and an air stone simply adds oxygen. Not really totally necessary when they're seedlings. As they get older, they will need it. Uh, so there's no submersible pump here. It's just an aquarium air pump, which is what makes it cheap and easy. Okay, next slide. Okay, so all the materials are listed here. They are listed again at the end. Um, as I said in the uh, video, the TDS um, pH meter, the, the pH down is optional. And then I didn't mention clay pellets there, but sometimes I add them, as you can see in the picture, just to give the roots something, uh, give some support. Um, I've even used a piece of ripped up t-shirt in a bind. I mean, plants are, they don't ask a whole lot and you can get by. Okay, next slide. Uh, as I said, about $10. Home Depot stopped carrying it. Okay, next. Um, I don't, I, I saw Jeremy used a styrofoam platform. Um, I, I found it didn't work in the smaller um, 10 gallon um, things as well, because I always was finding I was getting sun uh, sunlight getting in. And, you know, algae is your absolute worst enemy in hydroponics. So I guess I just wasn't doing it correctly, like his system looked like it would work OK. Plus, it really gets grody with algae. Um, I just found this nice because I had a nice black lid and nobody could see how dirty it was. So it worked. OK, next slide. Yeah, again, used a whole saw. And that is a larger pump. That's a four, four channel pump. You don't need one quite that big. You can um, get smaller ones at Walmart and clear tubing in a small air stone, super cheap. I mean, I've even gotten so desperate where I've moved air stone from tub to tub when we had a plug. Okay, this is where I buy my um, nutrient solution. It's Southern Ag and I get it in a big bag, you know, like a, a 40 pound bag or 25 pound bag from Big Earth. But um, this just contains the NPK. There are no micronutrients. And this is where the hydroponic farm near me, this is what they use for lettuce and herbs. And then they add calcium nitrate and magnesium sulfate for the larger plants. And so far it's worked for me. Okay, next slide. It's also available on Amazon. And I didn't know, I saw Jeremy had a, another brand there on his. Um, I've used Greenway in the beginning and I've had people um, there's another brand on Amazon too. And it's a pound for $20. So it's pricey, but if you're just starting out that 20 bucks or that pound is gonna go a long way. So, and what I do, and I have the kids make it up too, it's grams per gallon. But if you can figure out how many grams like, or how many teaspoons that is, it makes it real easy for the kids. So they don't have to get out the scale every time. Yes, I have not had any, I've never really tried these. They look awfully pricey to me. Um, next. Uh, and the seedlings, um, we are, I kind of explained that already, but that is the hard part. And I know we do it very low budget, but it works. There's a lot of manpower. Um, next slide. There's a lot of manpower involved, but the kids love to do it. 
uh, lots of times I do it in cocoa core and not soil. And I think this is cocoa core and they just think cocoa core is the coolest stuff. So, I mean, that, this one was planted a little tight with all those seedlings, but then um, I'll uh, have some kids pull them out individually and spread them out in other rotisserie chicken um, containers. So yes, it is um, manual labor and there's a lot of it, but they do enjoy it. And the more you get them involved, the more they're going to, the more they're going to like it. So that is butter crunch. Um, so I use butter crunch. I use mirror, which is heat uh, tolerant out regish romaine uh, that we um, get that from the NASA program we're in because that was the first lettuce grown in the uh, International Space Station. Mizuna does great. It's an Asian green and red fire. And then we're exper experimenting with bok choy, Swiss chard, but not so good so far. Um, and then any kind of herb basically just loves deep water culture or hydroponics. Okay, next. Um, so what like we have the kids do is shake out the soil or the cocoa core and water, put them in a net pot, and sometimes we add um, the clay pellets to support the plant. Now, the reason I can get away with this is that you don't have a sub pump, a submersible pump that might get soil in it and burn it out. You don't have any worries like this. All you have is an air stone. So who cares if you get dirt in the bottom of your tub? So it's very low budget, uh, high labor intensive, but the kids get a lot of hands on this way. And this is the TS meter I use. I think I saw a picture of the same one in Jeremy's presentation. Um, I think it's great. I mean, I'd let the kids use it because it is only 26 and, and nobody has destroyed one yet. So it's a good one. And then if the pH creeps up too much, next slide, I buy TH down and you use just a few cc's and it brings it right back down. So this will last me um, years and years. So again, the kids do all this. Um, I mentioned the LED lights. Um, that is a whole nother ball game, but if you can get grants, there are so many available on, on Amazon and these are just different ones I've used, but those are little three gallon totes with lettuce that we experimented with indoors. I mentioned that our seedlings are grown indoors. We sometimes take them outside too. So you don't need to have this set up, but it sure is fun when it's too hot to do hydroponics outside. And I just have all the kids uh, keep a journal of growth data and observations. So we plant our hydroponic garden and our soil garden, try to get them a few days of each other. And then we have a race and the kids can really see day by day, uh, how much faster hydroponics can be because of the direct um, uh, solution, uh, nutrient solution is absorbed directly. And I think, that, and there's my total list. And I thought I had some links on there now. Uh, if not, I have them for you. Now it's 120, that would be for one setup, but remember each tote is only $10 and you have enough there for 40 totes. So you just add 10 more dollars. So you could do a class of six, like I had for, you know, $150, $160. Very cheap to set up. Okay. And if you wanted to um, go to my website and or email me, I'd be glad to, to help. Okay. Thanks so much, Deb. Um, that was a really cool presentation. I love how straightforward and easy you make it. <laughs> it is. All right. So with that, I'm going to just leave you with one more note about um, different plants that you might want to start out with. So Deb mentioned a couple of different things that work really well for her. And these are just the specific varieties um, that we found from feedback from other teachers that have worked well too. Um, as Jeremy mentioned, you can get into the bigger, you know, fruiting varieties like tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, but that is a little bit more advanced. So I put more of the starter ones here. Um, lettuce, lettuce, lettuce is the best way to go. And um, looking for things that, you know, if, if you are going to do something bigger, something that's labeled grows well in pots or can uh, for a container variety. Um, I also found that if you're looking on like Johnny's seed catalog or any of those bigger seed companies online, you can usually do a filter and just filter by hydroponic specific varieties. So 
it's worth doing that and taking a look. Um, and then the thing that I'll mention aside from the leafy greens and the herbs that are really easy to start is that strawberries are also a really easy to grow thing in hydroponics. And you want to look for the day neutral cultivars, which are a year round fruiting cultivar. So just wanted to give you a um, couple of things to start off with, but lettuce, as you can see, is really easy to grow and any of those herbs. So with that, I think we're gonna go ahead and transition into our breakout rooms. We'll have about five, or, uh, five minutes to do that. And we have those all set up and ready to go. And we heard from you all that um, in our previous webinars, you wanted to be able to talk more with each other. You wanted to hear from teachers specifically and not just UFIFAS experts. So um, our goal here is really just to let you share your experiences with one another and maybe answer some of these questions. So we can go ahead and Becky, if you wanna launch the breakout rooms and then join away. And I think now we'll just go ahead and wrap up. Um, I know we're running a little bit over time. We wanna make sure we have some time for our questions as well. Um, so yeah, I, ho I hope that you had some good conversations and learned from one another. I know in our group, we talked a lot about just how it seems like hydroponics can be really complex, but really it's as simple as, or complex as you make it. And it's cool to see that there are so many different options out there that you can purchase that are already set up, or you can do kind of a more DIY system like Deb showed us. Um, so to recap, the three that we covered today are Arrow Garden, which is pretty beginner friendly and appropriate for elementary school students. Um, deep water culture, which, you know, air garden is a type of deep water culture, but the type that Deb showed us was more of an intermediate level because you have to do it yourself. Um, very appropriate for middle school and high school. And then the vertigo tower gardens might be a little bit more um, advanced and middle high school appropriate. Um, but once you get it all set up, it does kind of seem like plug and play and, you know, just monitoring those nutrients that are getting put in. So overall, choose a system that fits your space, your time, your budget, and your goals. Uh, consider the cost setup and the ongoing maintenance and uh, reach out if you wanna apply for a grant going forward. And hydroponics are a great teaching tool as we've seen. There's plenty of STEM connections and curriculum connections out there. What I like about it is that there is an opportunity for hands-on problem solving that students can get involved from the beginning to the end. Uh, and really kind of use those critical thinking skills along the way. And as we talked about, hydroponics is very productive. It's a great option for anyone looking to quickly harvest and consecutively harvest with their students. So you can use the produce that you're growing in things like taste tests or you know, nutrition connections or even possible procurement strategies getting it into the cafeteria. Um, there is, you know, less variables in some ways because you're not using soil, so food safety is a lot more easier to track. Um, and there's, there's a lot more opportunities out there, too, to use the produce. So we hope that you learned something about hydroponics today and you're looking forward to trying it on your own. Uh, it really isn't as hard as it seems. And with that, I think we will go into our Q&A session now. So if there's any questions that you had typed in the chat earlier, we have a log of those if they haven't already been answered. And otherwise you can um, type in the chat box or unmute yourself and ask questions and Becky will help moderate. And just a quick note that if you're unable to stay for the question and answer session, uh, please complete the surveys before you leave. We have one survey uh, that is just takes less than five minutes to give us some feedback on our sessions and how we can better serve you. And then we have one that is for professional development and CEU credit. Thanks. Okay, I see that Jeremy has been um, really good about answering the questions in there, but just to, uh, in case you guys missed um, in the beginning, somebody asked a question about the funding that staffs, that, that covers his, um, his position uh, and it said his program only allows for horticulture program specialists. So Jeremy, who oversees the program um, and trains all the teachers. So uh, they do utilize the master gardeners with extension and organize volunteer days through the summer. And I see he just answered the question about um, using distilled water. Is it, if using distilled water is, is it not necessary? But, um, he answered the question, water hose is normally good. You can always get a water test from UF if you're concerned. If you're growing produce for your school or restaurant, you must, uh, you must use 
potable water. Um, okay, so next question, Jeremy. Can you uh, share a little bit more about the nutrients to feed the hydroponic system? So what nutrients do you use? Yeah, so typically um, I use nutrients by Vertigro. So we are very fortunate in the sense that Vertigro is based in Marion County, which is where our school district is. So that's very fortunate for us, but they do they do business literally worldwide. And that's one thing I do want to uh, make clear. They literally are in, in over 100 countries. In fact, the Bohemian government just purchased 200 of their greenhouses, all filled with at least 30 towers in each one of them across all of their islands. And they're also buying the same units for every public school in the Bahamas right now because they are so phenomenal and they withstand all the wind from the hurricanes. So um, it's pretty phenomenal. But yes, we purchase our nutrients and stuff from them mainly because we've had a lot of success with it. And what's great about their nutrient mixtures is we, for every system we use and pretty much every single thing we grow, the same recipe works pretty, pretty good for every single, every single crop we grow. It doesn't matter if we're growing vine plants, if we're growing tomatoes, strawberries, whatever, it pretty much grows very well. I also mentioned on there, if you don't have access to that or you don't wanna grow from Vertigro, something super simple you can do is you can also purchase from Lowe's and just buy the all-purpose miracle Grow. Um, it comes as a powder from Lowe's and then a simple recipe for that is one and a half teaspoons of miracle Grow and one teaspoon of Epsom salt per gallon of water you're using in your reservoir. So for example, if you're using that 10, ga uh, 10 gallon um, uh, deep water culture system and you're just looking for something, you know, that's simple and easy to get really quick, you can buy that same solution and just base it off this recipe. So one and a half teaspoons of miracle Grow and one teaspoon of Epsom salt per gallon of water. It, likewise, if you're using a 42 gallon, we use a lot of 42 gallon uh, nutrient tanks because Vertigo actually sells a bag of nutrients, a 25 pound bag. I wanna say it's around 40 bucks. Um, and it, it goes into that 32 gallon tank perfectly and then it mixes and um, you don't have to do any measuring or anything. And it's perfect for that size tank. And, and we use that a lot for, for quite a bit of everything. So for the most part, the recipe is pretty consistent. Um, and the all-purpose miracle grow again, it, it will suffice for what you're doing at a school level. You know, I mentioned earlier in our breakout group, not everybody got to hear this, but, you know, a lot of times uh, if you talk to hydroponic specialists, and I've learned this down the road too, they're going to tell you everything that works the best. But what they're not necessarily going to always remember is that many of us are in schools and we just want to grow a plant that's successful and look good, but we're not looking to necessarily buy the best or to create or grow the best lettuce out there. And a lot of times people in the hydroponic industry, that's what they're going to try to get you to do. And so, because that's what they know and that's what they have found to work best and they want to give you the best advice they can. Um, but always keep that in the back of your mind. It, it doesn't need to be complex and a miracle growth solution works perfectly fine. Okay, Jeremy, what uh, variety of tomatoes did you use in the drip beto buckets? So those Dutch buckets were actually uh, at the UF Suwannee Valley Agricultural um, Extension Center. And so I'm not really sure what variety of tomatoes those were. I do know that the majority of their seeds they buy from a company called Johnny Seeds. Um, and they're phenomenal. They sell pelleted seeds, which are seeds wrapped in a, a clay coating, which you use a lot for hydroponic use. They are a little bit more expensive, uh, but I can tell you that they have very, very high germination rates and do very well in hydroponic systems. Yeah, like I mentioned, I was on Johnny's website earlier today and I saw, I went, actually went to the tomatoes section and I saw at least eight different varieties that they recommend for hydroponics specifically. So check that out. Yeah, and then I see another question about the Vertigo Tower, um, why the one single tower uh, required a cover because that single tower is more of a hobbyist unit that you can buy from Vertigro and it has the reservoir built into the bottom of it. And so what I have found, I mean, you can, ideally you can really grow it anywhere, but what I have found, I actually have one personally. And when I put it outside, um, what ends up happening is that, especially depending on when you're growing, if you're getting like a rain almost every day, or even if it's a five or 10 minute rain, your nutrient solution in the bottom of that reservoir is going to start changing quite a bit and it's going to become a weaker solution and you'll eventually see that in your plants like you'll start seeing quite a bit of yellowing and stuff whereas if you have a covering over it um, that really changes things because then you don't have to worry about that water watering down your solution and so that makes the biggest difference because those white pots as the rain water falls into that those white pots they drain down into the bottom of the pots which drain directly into the reservoir 
whereas the, the rest of the systems aren't like that. They don't have the reservoir underneath the tower. So that's a, a circulating system, the VG1 the, with the reservoir at the bottom. The rest of them don't have that at the bottom. So they're fed their nutrients and, and they're done. And their nutrients are, are kept in a separate reservoir with a lid on it so rainwater doesn't, doesn't um, get to it. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> so hopefully. <laughs> Jeremy, did you just answer the, the what is the cover? What do you use for that? Is that what you were just? Yeah, so as far as the cover is concerned, this really can be totally up to you. So it, like you can put in a greenhouse, um, like the greenhouse would be perfectly fine. And what I mean by cover is just basically like a roof over it to keep rainwater from watering down your nutrient reservoir. So um, I mean, literally, if you just had this one tower standing up in the middle of your yard or in the middle of your land lab, you can literally just put a PVC type roof over it with a plastic covering just so that way it still gets the sun it needs and everything else, but you don't have to worry about the water um, watering down your nutrient tank. Okay, the next question came in when Deb's video was playing. So Deb, any tips or things to know when it comes to maintaining the systems and cleaning and frequency? Um, are some systems easier than others? Yeah, so um, I think in a school setting, like don't get too hung up on it. Like we always clean out our systems as best we can. Um, mainly because we're providing a lot of produce for the school's cafeteria. So we wanna do as best of the job as we can. But at the end of the day also, I was explaining this in our, um, in our little breakout group. This is something I learned along the way when I, I did a lot of externships with UF up at their hydroponic research area in Live Oak. And I learned that you can always get more and more advanced, but when you're a teacher who's having to do lesson plans and grading and take care of you know, 25 to 35 kids at a time and doing all these things, a lot of those things you learn aren't 100% necessary. Obviously, you want to keep your system clean, you want to um, prevent, uh, you know, diseases from spreading. But for the most part, what we do, we grow different crops in our vertigo towers all year long. And then at the end of the year, we dump all of our media into compost and we rinse out our pots. And then if we are really concerned with the looks of the pots, which we try to keep them really clean because we consider our greenhouses our showcase um, rooms, we actually spray them with a 50-50 uh, water and bleach solution just to keep the pots nice and white and clean. Um, and then we let them air dry. And that's about it. Um, aside from keeping them clean and looking good, we don't even spray it necessarily because we're concerned with disease. Um, if you do know of a plant that has disease or has gotten something, uh, you might wanna wash out you know, your system as best you can with like a Dawn soap or something like that. But I think you're pretty, pretty good. Um, if I could just hop in on that deep water culture, um, we really don't have to worry about rain a whole lot in the deep water culture because you're already within a half an inch of the top. So a little bit of rain is not going to dilute it too much. But um, even in our vertical systems, you, if you can test your, you know, your TDS and your pH, and then we just physically add some more nutrient solution at the bottom. So yes, rain's a little bit of a problem, but you can just measure and add again. It's not overwhelming. And I have the kids do all this. It works. Deb, do you have um, a step-by-step -step diagram for the deep water, uh, the thing that you showed the video? Do you have like a step-by-step -step PDF or handout? Ooh, what about the slide presentation? That's not enough. We will share the slide presentation. Just somebody asked if there was a step-by-step, -step, but yeah, we'll have all of that. In I do part. have. I do have something else that I have used in other presentations. So yes, um, I can make that available if somebody wants to email me it's a little more detailed perfect um and jeremy this is a question for you but it came to me um do you ever do off-site training for teachers out of your county are you allowed to do that <laughs> um so unfortunately i cannot travel outside of my county except for going to like professional developments and things uh like that however during a normal year we actually open up our facilities for training purposes in this pat uh, march 2020 um, UF was actually going to come from the hydroponic research facility up there in Live Oak. They were going to come and use our greenhouses because um, it's a little more central in Ocala to um, have teachers come out and, and basically do an all day training with them, but do it at a level that's more sufficient for teachers. Because what I find when I go to a lot of these trainings that they offer uh, is you have people who are teachers there, but then you also have people who have a six acre greenhouse, you know, full of towers and they're growing tons and tons of stuff commercially for Publix. And so it's a little overwhelming. So we were just about ready to have our first training um, in March of 2020. And of course that was a week before everybody went home for the year. So 
So, but hopefully eventually we will have that up and going soon and, um, and, and we'll be able to invite people from surrounding counties to come out and check it out, so. So that was all of the um, questions that I had written down, but if you guys feel free to unmute yourself and ask more questions. And I'll also say, feel free to contact me anytime. Like, I mean, I'm, I have no problem sharing my number or um, my email, I think that has already been shared on there, but reach out to me and I, I will gladly help in any way I can or point you in, in a direction where you can get help, so. I had a quick question actually for both of you about the materials that you use. So you, you said that you, at the end of the season, would just compost them but you can't like actually compost some of those materials. So how do you discern what's safe to and how to safely get rid of it? Yeah, so um, I'm sorry, for us on our end, depending on what we're compost or what we have to compost, like coconut fiber does really well for us. Um, it's not gonna necessarily have a nu nutrition value to it. Like if we're using it for um, like or ornamental plants, we grow a lot of ornamental plants also, but um, some of that stuff we'll have to add nutrients into. As far as like perlite, Perlite's not necessarily considered biodegradable and it's not, or compostable for that matter, but uh, just like you see when you buy soil mixtures from the store, it has perlite kind of built into it as well. And so we kind of I, basically like I essentially, um, and depending on how much we add in there, we actually don't use a lot of perlite because of uh, what I mentioned earlier, as far as the dust being carcinogenic, but uh, with the rice holes and the cocoa fiber, those are our two main ones that we use rock wool that is just a unfortunately that's a, a discarded product because that's not biodegradable at all the, and we don't use i don't think we use any clay pebbles at any school because of um, the cost for them and just having other media um, it is really good because clay bubbles can be used over and over again for the most part but we in marion county don't really use it okay yeah and if you want to go the cheap route like we do all the time we reuse our pearl like so um, yeah, we don't do one time. I don't know, Jeremy, if you do, but that's, we reuse it. And you're right, we throw out the, the rock wool, but everything else is biodegradable. Mm -hmm. cool. All right. Deb, Deb, there's another question for you. It says, when you are transferring the baby lettuce seedlings from their first containers into the hydroponic containers, can you say again how that works? Uh, if they're large enough and the kids have planted them far enough apart, all I do is, or all I have them do is shake the roots of the plant in water to get off as much of the soil or cocoa core, whatever medium they use, uh, off, and then place them directly in the net pots. Sometimes, occasionally, we do use pellets to hold them up, but basically, you're just shaking off the dirt, putting them in the net pot, and then I do protect them from sun for the first day or two. So you don't really care if there is soil on the bottom. Now, this is not the ideal way to do it, but it works for kids. Thanks for sharing that adaptation. I thought that sunshade was really innovative. <laughs> 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 All right, well, it's about two minutes till. So I think with that, we'll wrap up our Q&A session. And I just wanna thank everyone for being here. Thank you to our presenters, Jeremy and Deb, and sharing your wealth of information and knowledge with us. Um, we would love it if you give us some feedback. We have a link to our survey in the chat box there as well as our PD survey if you need professional development credits. And once again, please join our Facebook group if you wanna to continue to network with folks. Um, we also have our Google Drive folder with additional resources. Um, we'll have this presentation as well as some of the resources that Deb mentioned, a couple of curriculum resources that she uses from her website um, and some other goodies from University of Florida. And please join us. Next uh, session is Tuesday, March 30th, and we'll be talking about aquaponics. Here, fishy, fishy, how to use aquaponics in the classroom. We have some awesome guests with us for that as well. So thank you again for being here as part of the School Garden Leadership Training Series.